Welcome back. I can't even begin to express my just privilege and honor and glee to introduce you to our next guests. We have a story that has never been told and we're breaking it right here. So we're talking about something that is so near and dear to my heart that as I was sharing this with my 92 year old dad just the other day, he said, oh, you know, Lauren, the Globetrotters are what made you love basketball. After that, you really just understood it. And he was absolutely right. So we are here today with Mark Jacob, who is the co-author of a new book called Globetrotter, How Abe Saperstein Shook Up the World of Sports. And if you don't know the name Abe Saperstein, he was the creator and owner of the Harlem Globetrotters. And we are going to dive into that story. But first, we're going to start by meeting his granddaughter, Abra Berkeley, and Hallie Bryant, who is not only the oldest living Mr. Indiana basketball, but he is the oldest living globetrotter, and he is here to share his stories with us today. So when I welcome you all from my heart, I really, really mean it. Thank you for being here. Abra, let's start with you. You weren't even alive when your grandfather died, but he was bigger than life, wasn't he? Uh, yes, he was. Yes, he was. My my mother would tell me stories about him. She loved, loved, loved her father. So uh, I, I grew up um, with all the stories, every every one that she had told me. So can you say? And how did that? How did how did that evolve um, for you? I mean, at this point, you're kind of the keeper of the legacy, and you have the memorabilia and the stories and. Have you had the opportunity to share much of this before? So um, my my mom had, it was always something um, talking about my grandfather. First of all, I Abra comes from the first four letters of Abraham. I was named after my grandfather. And um, and my 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 mother did so many things throughout her life to honor his name and his legacy. Um, she ran the Abe Saperstein Foundation out of Malcolm X College here in Chicago, where um, Isaiah Thomas, uh, Tony Parker, um, Terry Cummings, all those guys played. And any guy coming out of Chicago played at the Abe Saperstein Foundation at Malcolm X College. Um, and um, my mom had passed away about six years ago. And when I was going through her things, I had found her manuscript. She always, always wanted to write a book about my grandfather. She felt that there was so much more to him than just the globe trotters, And she really, really wanted that story told. And when Mark approached me about this, um, we, we had chatted a lot, a lot, a lot. And we there was, there had to be a trust issue and, and, and Mark went over my trust and I, with that and collaborating with him on that, I was, he, he put, um, we found the right vessel for my mom's manuscript and he used part of it in the book for her words to get out there about her father. And so I look at this as a, an, fulfilling my mom's wishes and honoring her lifelong dream of getting my grandfather's story out there into the world so that people would know really all about the man. So um, this, it, you know, I, I think she would be really happy that people a hundred years later are, are speaking the name of Abe Saperstein. First of all, I I love that you have 
picked up and are running with the mantle. That's that's really, really special that your mom actually put it all down in writing is incredible. Most of these stories simply get passed on orally or over dinner or something like that. So how special to have them all in writing. And I say this also to say to our viewers, write your stories down. <laughs> Write your stories down because a hundred years later, people are going to want to know who you were, even if it's just for friends and family, it's a legacy and there is so much you can do with it. But your grandfather, two things that stood out for me and, and I have so enjoyed researching your grandfather, what an amazing human, but he, he was way more than basketball. He really was after enhancing the world, like really taking on this, doing something good in the world anywhere he could. So tell us a little bit about him beyond basketball. Well, um, Mark will go into some further details, but I think one of my, this is, this is my grandfather's favorite story. So um, the Globetrotters in 1950 made their first trip to Europe. They had just beaten the Minneapolis Lakers and and beating George Mikan, um, who was a DePaul alum. And the, um, the United States government asked him as ambassadors of goodwill to fly to Berlin and to fly to Berlin, Germany to, as, as the hand going out with the olive branch to Germany after World War II. And he arrived in Berlin Stadium. 75,000 people were there. It was the largest audience to ever see a sporting event at the time. It was in Guinness Book of World Records for years. And he came in with Jesse Owens. And Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics had won the Olympics. And that's when Hitler was in power and Hitler left the stadium and refused to shake Jesse Owens' hand after winning the Olympics. So when my grandfather brought in Jesse Owens, he landed in uh, into the middle of the stadium and he made the run around the track and went to the mayor of Berlin and the mayor of Berlin said, Hitler refused to shake your hand. Today, I give you both my hands. And that was his, that was my grandfather's favorite story. Then the Globetrotters played in the middle of this of the field. And and the whole whole crowd erupted. And every time I tell that story, it's so touching to me. And that that is who, that is the pinnacle of the stories that I could tell about him of the man he was. Amazing. It, it touches me every time I hear any of these stories or read any of these stories. So again, Mark, thank you for writing this book because these are stories that absolutely need to be told. I'm gonna to jump to you for a second, Mark, and say, you act, you have a long, long history of, this is your 10th book that you've co-authored. And I understand that you've co-authored this one with your brother. Yeah, my brother, Matthew. Amazing. And how much fun is that? <laughs> well, it's funny, actually, Matt, Matt lives in the Washington, D.C. area. And so just to stay close, we do projects like and, and one of the reasons for doing this book was for he and I to stay close and to have something to talk about and just to do. A, and we both share a love of history and sports. And we both felt like that when the more we looked into it, the more we realized that Abe Saperstein was vastly underappreciated as a figure in American sports. I would absolutely agree. And so I think what you've done is tremendous. And you actually have written books on photography, baseball, basketball, history, the American Revolution. This is okay. this is not just you and sports. You've also been an editor for the Chicago Tribune for many years. Okay. So writing and research are your life and finding these, you know, these stories and un really uncovering the great stories. So thank you. So how did you come to this project? 
I just, actually, a friend of mine suggested it. My brother and I were looking for a biography to write. And a friend of mine suggested, well, have you thought about Abe Saperstein? And the more we looked into it, the more we were amazed by how much we didn't know. You know, we had all known the, we both of us had known the Harlem Globetrotters angle, which, you know, still, I think, is the most important thing about Abe. But we didn't know, and hardly anyone knows, that he pioneered the three-point shot in basketball. He is... You know, Caitlin Clark and Steph Curry owe a, a debt to Abe Saperstein because in 1961, when he started the American Basketball League, he brought in the, for the first time ever in a basketball league, the three-point shot. And now it's transformed the game of basketball. Abe Saperstein is the father of the three-point shot, and he transformed the game of basketball that way. He also was the person who brought... Uh, who brought Satchel Paige into the major leagues, the great pitcher after the color barrier went down. He discovered Minnie Minoso, another famous ba baseball player. He helped keep the Negro Leagues in business back when they were struggling. He was co-owner of the Negro Leagues baseball team. And he also helped keep the NBA going in its early years. He saved the NBA. If yeah. It the Globe, if it wasn't for the Globetrotters, the NBA wouldn't be existing right now. The Globetrotters, they played a doubleheader, and because the Globetrotters uh, uh, played first, then, then, then the artist stayed there to see the NBA. So he saved the whole league. So that story that, should be told. That story should be told. That story absolutely should be told. I, there are two other stories that, <laughs> that I think are wrapped around this. Is Number one, the Harlem Globetrotters were not from Harlem. <laughs> no, they weren't. No, it, I mean, Chicago. <laughs> You're from oh, Chicago, oh. Kelly, right? No, he's from Indiana. That's right. You're from Indiana. That's right. You're from Indiana. But the early like, players were. The early players were all from Chicago. And, you know, and, and so when he started it out, they the Harlem Globetrotters were not from Harlem and they were not Globetrotters. They were just, you know, five Southside kids, you know, basketball players. And Abe took him in his Model T Ford out on the road to these small towns in Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, and eventually made them famous. They certainly weren't globetrotters in the early years. They were just driving around in a Model T Ford. And they, but eventually they won the world. And Hallie knows all about that. I mean, he was part of it in the later years. Yeah. The Hall of Globetrotters were known all over the world. And they call us the ambassador of the Hall, ambassador of basketball. And because people like to laugh, whenever you can do something for an audience to cause them to laugh, they, they always want to come back. That's why we sold out much just about everywhere we went. And we brought countries together, broke down the the the, uh, the barrier between black and white. That story should be told. I absolutely agree. And Hallie, you know, as a kid, I didn't fully understand that the Globetrotters were beyond extraordinary basketball players. I thought you guys were just out there having fun and entertaining the crowds. But in fact... You were playing some of the most extraordinary basketball on any court in the world. So, Hallie, I you, you stayed with the team after playing for 13 years. And what did yes. you do? What did you do after playing for the team? He played for 27 years. No, Hallie, I, you played for 27 years, didn't you? No, I played for 13 years, but then I formed a one-man Hall of Glowfront show. And because of the name uh, Hall of Globetrotters, they allowed me, Abe Saperstein allowed me to use his uniform. So I would go into cities and promote the Globetrotters. And so I would go to the hospital and people that were shut in and I'd do a one-man Globetrotters show. If you go on YouTube, you'll see me. I'm a Hall of Globetrotters. Hall of Globetrotters. You'll see me being interviewed by the, the, the person in charge of that particular TV program. So he, I mean... I, hmm? what, what, Lauren, what he did was advanced work. So he would let right. he would PR. let the, the 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 small towns know that they were coming to town, right, Hallie? Exactly. Uh -huh. So you played for thirteen years, and then you did your one man opening act in order to promote them. So you were doing the PR for the Globetrotters. During the off season, I, I continued to keep the Globetrotters name alive by doing that. But during the regular season, I would play, and then after playing. I go do some other stuff on the outside to let the people know that both brothers come to town, and because of that, uh, we got packed houses, sold out crowds, and stuff like that. I I believe they were always sold out crowds, weren't they? Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs>
-hmm. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. And Helly, what's your favorite? Do you have a favorite memory of all of this? Or are there just too many? There's so many, you know, traveling around the world uh, and then uh, becoming a wealthy person really because of them. So being independent and, and, and I think I was probably one of the only one that Globe Glo 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 Prize and Sabatine allowed me to use a real uniform, which I have photographed. I still have the uniform. Do you? That's amazing. And then Hallie, you went on to become a motivational public speaker. Yes. Why did you do that? Well, number one, well, you could make money, you know, big, big companies will call you in to speak to their, 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 their workers and everything. And they wanted to be, have them motivated to uh, do well and everything. So uh, that's why I did it, because I enjoyed it. They would ask me questions about the growth How do you, how'd you do this? And then I would demonstrate some of the things that the people, oh. so edutaining. Edutaining. I'm, I'm, I'm an edutainer. Yes, Teaching indeed you me. are. Indeed you are. Mark, I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> I want to, I definitely want to know more about the book. And so somebody turned, you were looking for a biography. You obviously found one. And what, what really stood out for you as you were moving on with your work? Well, I, I, it's that I, I was, we were just kept on being impressed by how Abe Saperstein was just the, probably the most energetic human being that we'd ever like researched or read about. I mean, he was a dynamo. The man was constantly, constantly doing stuff. He, he, not only was he involved in baseball, but basketball, he managed boxers. He, um, he started a lacrosse league in Chicago, if you believe it or not. He was doing minor league baseball. He was Negro leagues baseball. He was doing, um, I mean, you, you name it. And he just, it seemed like he never slept. He, um, there's a story in the book about how the sports writer saying that Abe Zapperstein called him up at 2 a.m. just to talk with him about how he didn't think his team was playing very well lately and how, and how could they make them better at 2 a.m. So, I mean, so it's, it's like, did he ever sleep? It's like he, he was 63 when he died in the mid sixties and he packed so much into his life. It's just, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, you just because they didn't have a home court. The the Globetrotters were not a, ever a home team. They were always on the road, and and so it was an incredibly grueling life. Where, but the thing about Saperstein that made it so successful was what a people person he was. How he he met people all over the place. He he really, as a former journalist, I'm amused by all the stories about him. You know. Uh, making friends with sports writers because he did it in ways that I don't think would be legitimate today. Like he would send boxes of apples to sports writers just to thank them. And he'd like he'd send them, you know, jewelry and stuff. I mean, he, he was, he was really kind of charming sports writers and they loved it because he was a real glib talker and he would always give them things to write about. And so he was, he, so he was really beloved and he was, he was a huge, person in sports for them in the middle of the last century and i think part of the reason that he's not as well known as he should be today is because it, you know in the 50s they started playing against a, a traveling team with them the washington generals which in effect was designed to make them play make the games entertaining but the globetrotters would always win the game uh -huh. and so it became more of a show than a sport and I think for that reason, some of the sports purists thought, well, it's just this is just a circus. But th what they didn't understand was that Abe Saperstein had really had the fan at heart. And he was he specialized his halftime shows were amazing and way ahead of their time. If you look at what the NBA All Star Weekend is with the you know, with all the hoopla and all the parties and all the three point shot contests and everything, that's Saperstein's style. Of doing of yes, not just sure. being a, not just being a basketball game, but being a total show that the halftime has got somebody got acrobats and jugglers and it has uh, he would have ping pong games played at halftime. He would have he had Althea Gibson, the famous tennis star, touring with him and playing tennis before the games. He would he was 
And he always was caring about the fan and trying to invent new things. He, he was one of the most visionary and audacious people in the business of sports. I he had to. And he brought in people like Satchel Paige. That's right. He brought in people like Satchel Paige. Any, any well known person in the athletics, he would bring them in. And, and as a result, who he brought in, they got national, worldwide. Uh, recognition too. So he was, like you said, he was amazing in many ways. He so, and, and he, he allowed me to do so many things that. Uh, yeah, hmm? he t he spotted talent and then he encouraged and nurtured it, didn't he? That's that's, that's for sure. Uh, that's the gift. But he did it across every sport, which I did not realize until I started right. researching myself. And that's unusual. Was he an athlete himself? Albert might want to talk a little bit about this because he was, right? And you have some of his old sports, you know, his high school team photos and things like that, right, Albert? So uh, my grandfather went to Lakeview High School. And according to my mom, um, he won the most uh, letters of anybody ever at Lakeview High School. So um, he... If there was a sport, he loved it, and he always wanted to play. At a at a whopping five four, you know, height does not run in my family. Um, you know, he loved he loved his basketball track. He played on the wall, so you know that was that was him. Has that continued down your line? Do do your kids play sports? Um, well, I have. I my my youngest son right now is playing. Um, hockey, football, rugby, and wrestling. So, yes. and he's a sophomore in high school. Uh, and my middle son played uh, hockey. So, yes. Is and and nobody took up basketball in my family. We didn't okay. have the height. <laughs> well, obviously, neither did your grandfather, but that did not stop him. And that's why the three-point shot was so important to him when he created it, because it was his idea that the short man should be able to play the sport too. And giving, giving a guy by four opportunity to score at the three point shot and not go in f with the, the seven footers right. to, to compete with them, that they would have just as much of an opportunity on the floor. So um, that, that came from, from, allowing everybody to have that opportunity on a basketball court, which is what, like Mark had said, where, you know, Caitlin and Steph really make a difference in the sport, though they're not seven footers. Right. Right. And they, I don't even know if they know to celebrate Abe Saperstein in doing all of this, but maybe we'll get a chance to ask them. One of the things that my mom also wanted to achieve was during All-Star Game weekend, they have the three-point shot game on Saturday. And she really, she had talked to the commissioner about it. I spoke to him this last All-Star uh, weekend in Indianapolis and that the trophy should be named Abe Saperstein. Okay. So let's, we can get that going off your podcast. Off the broadcast, we can do anything in conjunction with Mark's book. We're right there, Hallie. Yes, there's a, there's a song called Sweet Georgia Brown. And that song, if you play it anywhere in the world, it's all the growth from all the growth from Sweet Georgia Brown. And the author of it is, is so famous. In fact, just before I would go out and do a program, I would have the music play two or three minutes, Sweet Georgia Brown. People outside heard it came in there. All them growth trotters. And see, it's such a visual thing. And like I said earlier, it's, it's edutaining, people feeling good about them, clapping their hand, laughing, and looking for the famous. Hall of Love Trotters with Goose Tatum. He was very iconic. He, Goose Tatum, and he would get sides and curl and The showman and the dribbler were the, one, the, the ones that was stood out the most. Well, and every kid in my became, neighborhood could spin a basketball on their finger by watching uh, the Harlem Globetrotters. It was not the Knicks which, who were teaching them to spin basketballs. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> but right. tell me, which, I don't know which one of you has this answer, but... Why did he call them the Harlem Globetrotters if the original team? There's a place in New York called Harlem. It's yeah. Predominantly black. Harlem Globetrotters. Globetrotters around the world with black organization, Harlem Globetrotters. Worldwide. You got it. You got it from the mouth of the oldest living Harlem Globetrotters. He was in their first years, 
it was a five foot, five foot three inch Jewish guy with five black players from the South Side going to predominantly white or maybe exclusively white towns in Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota. And he called them the Harlem Globetrotters because he wanted to signal to people, hey, I'm bringing these black guys into your town. Don't be surprised. He didn't want any surprises or any any unpleasantry. He wanted that to be clear. So that's why he used Harlem as a as a symbol for black people. And, and, and he had to break, break, break down the racial barrier. Right. And the, a lot of people, a lot of people, they might have thought like some of the black people had tails. But whatever, whatever. He, he, he like I said, he, he probably brought people together. Let yeah. people see that. So he... And he doesn't get enough credit for it, but his granddaughter, she's uh, helping people to see the real story. And we're going to help spread the word as much as we possibly can. Mark, I understand the book is available in October? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's just getting into stores now. The okay. official publication date is October 1st. Perfect. So, yeah, so it should be available, available on Amazon and, you know, many other book selling. I have, my, I have my copy already. Well, all right, Holly, you're in the book, too. I mean, you know, you're quoted in it. Yeah, well, that's, that's wonderful. Keep I, hope alive. Yeah. Go ahead, Holly. I said keep hope alive and keep on caring uh, things that cause people to laugh and have fun. Laughter is humor and it's good for the soul. Sweet <laughs> Georgia Brown. Indeed it is. Music, laughter, hope. You got it. Those are the things you brought to the world. And thank you all so much for sharing this amazing story, the legacy, everything that you're bringing forward. I'm so grateful. It has brought back joy into my life in a way that I, I didn't know I was missing. <laughs> so thank you. We'll look for the book wherever books are sold. And if we can have a follow-up with you, after some time and have a bigger discussion after every maybe we need a book club there you go there you yeah. go we'll see what we can do thank you all so much for joining me today and thank, thank you, you for having audience. us it's, it's thank, you. thank you too it's our pleasure and we'll be